So welcome everybody. I am very honored uh, to be uh, having one of my dearest friends here, uh, who also I happen to believe to be one of the most brilliant visionary men alive today. So, <laughs> and when you hear who it is, Dr. Stephen Porges, most people around the world will agree with me. Uh, Steve, what you have done to change this world uh, just touches my heart and as you well know, I, I wear, I have many roles, but my most important role is that of a grandmother. I know that your grandfatherhood is pretty important to you as well. <laughs> and uh, what you have done to help my grandchildren, uh, I think is immeasurable. So I could do the usual things that people do where what you are a distinguished uh, university scientist at the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. You are a professional, uh, professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina. You have written, been on 300 peer review um, <laughs> papers, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, um, what I am the most touched about is that you are a scientist that walks his walk, speaks his talk, uh, you know, or you know, you have learned about social engagement and the need for social engagement and and creating safety especially is the way you live so i am very touched by that so thank you for um, agreeing to talk to me about one of my favorite topics today and that is movement and well thank you donnelly it's it's really wonderful to see you even though i can't give you a hug i i am giving you a hug uh, and thank you for the kind words. Um, I think over time, when you're a, on a journey of discovery, you don't think of uh, the discoveries as products. You think of them as literally doors that are opening to a better understanding. And you shift your goals. When you're an academic, your goals are productivity, uh, publications, sphere of influence. But as you achieve or reach a certain amount of success, your life changes and you have an opportunity to leverage those forms of success to start being helpful to humanity, to start utilizing what you find out and translating it into a language, into a vocabulary, into a technology that can be useful for others. So in my, I sit back with not a sense of accomplishment, but more of a sense of gratitude that I am rediscovering what has always been known, and that's part of the, the uh, map or the manual of what it is to be a human and how to optimize that. And I think that's really what our discussion will, will be about, which is about, uh, because continuum takes some of those same themes and movement becomes that underlying theme. And before we even get deeper into that, we're gonna give you the metaphor between uh, continuum movement uh, perspective and a polyvagal perspective Within polyvagal perspective, the movement really is the rhythmicity of the neural regulation of our physiology. And within continuum, the movement is, is the rhythmic movement that you experience and you observe. So in a sense, they're the same thing from different levels of observation. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. I have to say, I did leave out one of what I have told you is one of your greatest accomplishments, and that is having married probably one of the most wonderful women and most brilliant women, woman and around, Dr. Sue Carter, who I, you know, we're sisters. I adore her. So. <laughs> yes. so. Well, you know, Sue is not only very special, my, my trajectory and what I've been doing is greatly been influenced by Sue and her interest in social behavior and social connection and, and pair bonding. I mean, that was really what she came, she feels that she rescued me from experimental psychology and looking at attention in those processes and in a sense brought me into the world of social interaction or dyadic co-regulation. And I appreciate that. And we've had this kind of remarkable parallel careers, which is very unusual for again, academic couples to both in a sense uh, fulfill their own personal journey of discovery yet find that their personal uh, journey of discovery overlapped. And so they therefore uh, have a common, uh, they have something to talk about at dinner. So what, what I used to say is we had independent research programs for the first 20 years, 
and then we got reacquainted in the brainstem because <laughs> uh, she was studying the neurochemistry of social body and I was studying the neuroregulation of the autonomic nervous system and basically start learning that these were basically integrated systems and it just depended upon where you were uh, where you were looking but they were really part of the same integrated mechanisms uh, I, I love a true love story <laughs> um, so yes uh, I, today I want to talk about continual movement and the polyvagal uh, I would um, and it's true in continual movement one of the things we say is continual movement is an inquiry into what it means to be a human being mm -hmm. and it provides a somatic way to explore oneself as a living biological and uh, what we also like to say is cosmic being. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I, and I do see the deep connections. Uh, what, for myself, who I, I guess I probably need to introduce myself too to the group. Uh, I'm Donna Leah Van Vliet Geltz. Uh, I hold a PhD in uh, somatic psychology and I am, when I was in grad school, I went to grad school quite late, I was very profoundly affected by the polyvagal theory, which you helped start, I think it was around 1994 that you came up with the idea and, and presented it at a conference. And I, it, I mean, a door must have opened. <laughs> you know, it was so amazingly different. And, and all of a sudden it was like this big, aha, Steve. It's like, oh wow, this, because the, the other, the seesaw old way of the system did not match. So. I, can you speak a little bit about all of that? Yeah, you know, well, we live in a world, you know, people use terms like linear or uh, spreadsheet models of life. We think less about how uh, elements are related to each other or in a sense connectedness within the body and bodies being connected with each other. So we start looking at elements and if, if we start thinking about uh, like the medical profession, where you go, if you have uh, uh, your, your stomach bothers you, you go to a gastroenterologist. If you have skin problems, you go to a dermatologist. If you have cardiovascular one, you go to a cardiologist. So you start getting this partitioning of what it is to be a living system, yet your body is connected to itself and connected to others. And what we really want to bring into the fore is what polyvagal theory basically was telling us. It was not was telling us really that we have one nervous system and that nervous system regulates various uh, subsystems within the body, but they're in a, there's a model about how it does it. So in terms of the autonomic nervous system, there's actually a hierarchy of systems. And once you understand that, you understand that hierarchy is really a reflection of our own evolutionary history. You start understanding uh, how our body literally does, uh, it basically goes back in evolution and the term is dissolution. It goes back to more primitive systems. And of course, when does it do that? When we're under threat. So when we're scared or when we're ill, we retract to older systems that evolve to be defensive. But the newer systems, the mammalian systems, have capacity for social engagement, connectedness, nurturance, benevolence, uh, gratitude, compassion, they are a, it's a neural system that is really what makes the human experience a wonderful experience mm -hmm. yet with that knowledge what do we do with it we create contexts where we say we don't need that we need to be more mobilized and how do we get people more mobilized more active more productive we scare them mm -hmm. and even when we want to deal with health issues how do we deal with health issues within medicine we deal with it as chronic evaluation you go to a doctor to be evaluated. Is that a relaxing exploration of learning about your body or is it threat inducing? And of course, everything we do, whether it's education or medicine, tends to be evaluative and really makes people less than who they really could be. And so we want to shift the narrative. We want to shift it within medicine to a narrative of a shared journey of learning about health, learning about ourselves, in education, we want to share a journey of the excitement and enthusiasm of discovery. Absolutely. Well, that is um, that is part of the 
fun for me in continual movement because it instead of doing repetitive movement i have taught tai chi also as you know for over 30 years and i love it and it's very relaxing and it's strengthening it's grounding there's a lot of positive things to be said about that too but the the living in the present moment of the unknown and just being with sensations to me is so different and and it's not putting an overlay a, a pattern a evaluation on it it's it, and it's so healing for me because of that um, well i would say you're fortunate because <laughs> many people uh sensations are especially sensations that are novel are disruptive to predictability and frightening so if you can allow sensations or experience them without evaluating them life becomes expansive and interesting uh, but remember as a human being as a neural human being expectancy is part of the way that is one of the ways that we feel safe in ourselves in our context in our body and we can flip this really 180 degrees by talking about the pandemic so what's going on in the pandemic it's basically a violation of expectancy of how we live our lives what tomorrow will be like, whether we're going to be healthy. Um, we basically haven't built a narrative that enables us to live in this very challenging time. And the narrative has to say, oh, you know, it's challenging, but you know, we have friends, we have, you know, loving relationships, we're healthy. And, you know, we, for many of us, we have sufficient resources so that it's not going to hurt us. We may not have as much of a resource at the end end of this that we went into it but so what we're fine uh, and then we start having a sense of compassion and understanding for the millions of people whose livelihoods are challenged whose family structures are challenged who have to work and and educate their kids at home and who may be in relationships that are far from safe and welcoming but they're contained they're confined so we have to have this really uh, an understanding of the suffering of what's going on in the, in the, in the world and basically in our, literally in our communities. And we also have to have this compassion of grieving for the whole world because people are dying. Yeah. And that's not part of our dialogue. It's not part of our narrative. And yet our body knows it's real. So we are sensing a lot of these other things that we don't even have language for. But we have to, in a sense, I think your, your point is the real point we have to allow our bodies to feel what's going on before we make a decision and say, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to touch that. Well, and also just, you know, cause I, you know, my dissertation was the effect of um, Tai Chi on PTSD. So I've studied, I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable about trauma as well. And what I would say, one of the things that I have done, and I was already there in continuum, but I have in, I've been really emphasizing it more, is the ability to create a group of people that have common feelings. And in a class, therefore, we create this field the, the, mm -hmm. of common uh, mutual acceptance of safety and protection for each other. And there's something in it. I, it may be even going back to our tribal beginnings, uh, Steve, of when you're with a group that is holding the same intentionality of, mm -hmm. of caring, kindness, compassion, mm -hmm. it makes you, it gives you, I guess, and that makes you, it gives you the ability to do things that you might not be able to do by yourself. Well, let's start off by saying we are not isolates. That's not, this as a species, we. We didn't evolve that way. We evolved to regulate or co-regulate our fears and our threats through social interaction. And so the term I like to use is our goal in life is to be a good enough co-regulator. Of course, we run across super co-regulators and we just gravitate just to sit in their presence because we feel good when they're there. But our bodies know this, we understand this, and that's why groups and like you're you're really talking about the continuum community which it's really in the forefront it says you know these are the experiences that you have when you do continuum but there's something else it's part of the shared experience as well and this is powerful and as i'm on my journey now which is pulling me into various other 
uh, subdisciplines, including pain management, not just because I went through my own little personal experience, but I'm actually uh, on a think tank group talking about it. And, and again, with pain management, you're finding out that groups work effective in pain management and people don't want to leave the group. So they're getting better, but they don't want to leave the group because they now have this very special relationship. I'm also learning about addiction. And remember, when you deal with pain management, you also are often dealing with addiction and withdrawal issues. And you start finding out when people have addiction problems and withdrawal problems, they tend to be more isolated. They don't have the group. They don't have the co-regulators in their world. So we're learning that this co-regulation through proximity, through parity, through mutual respect, through honoring your feelings, your own personal feelings, but honoring those around you. And remember, honoring is not evaluating. And, and really understanding that our bodies want to express how we feel, want this, want to do this, but we don't want to be evaluated for what we're expressing, which means we don't want people to fix it. We just want people to say, uh -huh, <laughs> I'm here with you. Uh, you know, as opposed to, oh, that's horrible. I don't know how you dealt with that. I'm going to do it. And we, we all fall into this because we say that if, if this is a horrible thing, we feel that we have to express the horror. But when people who have experienced the horror are telling you this, they do not want you to share the horror that they experience. They get hurt. They get victimized a second time, re-traumatized. If their narrative of their journey of which they are heroic in surviving, ends up hurting someone, making them feel bad. So we have to understand what is it that other people want from us in that diet, in that community. They want us to be there. They want us to hear their voice. They want us to witness them, not to change them. So beautifully said. It's it's. Uh, I remember in my all my you know as being a psychologist, it was the early training, I really could see how I wanted to find a way to help them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it took me a long time to just keep uh, sinking back into the middle part of my heart and just listen and witness and yeah. realize I, I, you do it enough times, you see how that is really helping them. So. It, it's an interesting issue, and including when people start to, let's say, take on certain Buddhist traditions and Kind of westernized the buddhist traditions but they got part of it at least this is let me let me be real careful let me say my interpretation is they got part of it right they listened but then they said we have to fix it <laughs> and i think in doing that they have to be very careful because how do you make that turn i'd say i have to fix it in a person without telling that person something's wrong with them Right. And so this is where this compassionate witnessing, uh, which is a powerful intervention in itself, is really the restraining of one's intuitive desire to fix or right the wrong that was done to that person. Mm -hmm. And we can see it when people get into retribution, it doesn't work. It's an endless cycle. Wow. Beautifully said. I, I just love talking with you. <laughs> as I, <laughs> so uh, I just taught a two-part series to Continuum um, um, students about the polyvagal. And I went back and I, you know, introduced, you know, the, the, the ventral uh, system, the dorsal, the autonomic and things like that. And, and then it was really interesting when I went to really think about it. Um, how do you explain movement through the polyvagal? I, I, it was like, okay. I had some ideas, but I thought, well, I could go to a, the expert and ask him. <laughs> well, remember, we're making it up as we go along. So uh, they, it's, there's not a catechism here. There's not a dogma. But you have to ask really the question, how is movement being used? Because in polyvagal terms, we use the term word mobilization to, in a sense, uh, uh, include all the uh, muscle activity. So when you have engorgement of muscles, even in a state of freeze, it's a metabolically mobilizing state. You're metabolically uh, getting your systems going. So uh, you have to really put it into context. So if you are moving and still maintaining social communication 
with the social engagement system, people call that play. That's really what Continuum is. Continuum uses the social engagement network of voice, face, gesture, and proximity, of feeling safe with other in proximity of other to enable movement now to be playful. And so movement is very powerful. We love movement as a species, uh, but we love movement if we're safe. And we love movement in the presence or in the interaction with others. So it's a difference between playing versus exercising. You know, you exercise by yourself, but really you'd rather like go for a walk and talk to someone, uh, or you'd like to play a sport. Uh, it's different because you're using facial cues and vocalizations and gestures while moving. Now we call this dancing. So when you have the dance movement therapists, they're, they're in a sense intuitively understanding the power of that social engagement system with voice and gesture and signaling with movement, and they see the pleasure of it. But if you now flip it to kind of a less positive vignette and say, well, there are some people who don't play well. <laughs> and what do we mean by that? Well, if children don't play well. They basically aren't picking up the cues of others and people get hurt, they get hit, and people don't repair the ruptures. So when you play and get hit or hurt, those become opportunities for repair. So those ruptures can very nicely be changed as saying, oh, I'm sorry, and leaning over and helping up a person, uh, or clumsy me, or whatever term we want to use. But it's in a sense, having the capacity to repair. The kids, and who may become the adults who don't play well, are the ones who lack the awareness of that social engagement system to accurately detect the features of others in their proximity. So polyvagal theory says movement is wonderful, but we enjoy movement the most when we have access to the social engagement system because it contains our physiology from going into aggression and rage. So the, the real issue is what's the difference between movement that is play versus movement, which is aggression, aggressive. Well, in many aspects, it's simply the voice and the face will make it different. That's it. Uh, and of course, when we see people walking at tours and they have a stern face and their voice is stern, what's their body do? So we have, in a sense, this little micro vignette within our own bodies of someone walking over to us to be abusive, whether it's to reprimand us or to pick a fight or, you know, they're using in their own personal narrative, the other as a way of justifying why they are in this mobilized aggressive state. Mm -hmm. And what I've become very interested in is this concept of appeasement, which I believe is this unique quality of super co-regulators who are in very adverse situations where they have the capacity to in a sense, turn off the aggressiveness of someone coming at them. And so we need to see appeasement, not as something uh, where a person's weak, but a person is surviving with this very intuitive skill and need to really respect that because if they didn't have that, they'd be physically injured, if not killed in situations. So appeasement is really this ability to change the course of an aggressive act. It's, it's definitely, we need so much more of it in today's world. Um, it's interesting that you say that there's social engagement in continuum because I would think some people would say there isn't, but I absolutely agree with you, uh, Steve. What I, so continual movement is, is along a line of continuum. And there's some of our work, especially our physical fit work, uh, jungle gym and that, where we are more engaged with each other and, mm. and uh, physically actually do see others and stuff like that. The, the other side, the, on the other uh, side of the spectrum is when we're actually laying down and we're going deep inside our bodies doing sound and movement. And I, it took me a while to realize that there was still this deep connection socially mm. going on of safety and that. And then we come out of uh, our dives and we share. Mm -hmm. And that sharing is some of the most important part because we the sharing is where we all both, 
Well, we're not on both. The whole group has a chance to actually evolve uh, and see things in a different light than that. So I absolutely agree that we are socially engaging. And I, I just wanted to say this because I have, I know there's always, Continuum has all these people and it, some would say absolutely not, but I say absolutely yes. Well, let's deconstruct. First of all, when you, you do it in close proximity, even if you are in a sense with, with going into your dives, which would be kind of a withdrawn individual response, but you're doing it in proximity. Our bodies, to get into a personal space to go into a dive means that you're safe in the proximity of other. This is powerful. When you're safe in the proximity of other without having to maintain face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact, you are in position to have shared moments of intimacy. And I don't mean sexual, I mean intimacy. And what you're saying is that that's part of the debriefing that occurs after your dive that people are divulging their experiences. And that's part of this enables even greater cohesiveness within your group because you're, you're in this physiological state of literally a passivity uh, and vulnerability, but it's not vulnerability, it's accessibility. And that accessibility is powerful in building the social bonds that occur within the continuum. I Love it. <laughs> uh, Emily would, would agree. That's she would. Good. She would. I, I brought a couple Emilyisms to share. Uh, actually, uh, it, 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 to me, they make, um, they make such sense. So we have this thing. I think I've explained it to you already, Steve, of uh, Emilyisms. And it's things she would say and that were just like little sentences or a couple sentences that just really hit the tone exactly. And one of them I would like to bring up today, which is every time you move, fear loses and creativity wins. Yeah, well, this is the say, the metaphor within, within polyvagal theory is as long as social, as long as you maintain social engagement, there is no fear. Yeah. And so, and what we're saying is because in, in Emily's conceptualization, movement is social movement or movement without fear. She just defined it, that fear loses, which means that movement is not aggression, it's movement. And you, when you have movement without being used for defense, then it's the social engagement system on board. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're really touching on something for me uh, with that statement. One of the things I'm very curious about with Continuum is, we, um, you have a concept, what is it? Uh, it's, it's one of our highest, it's one of the highest states you say, it's where there can be, oh, how does it, it it's where you, you're not moving, what, what is it? Oh gosh, I'm losing the thing. Move, um, oh, is it where you don't, where right? you don't need to look at someone? Uh, with the, it, uh, it has to do with, um, the ability to remain, that you feel safe being still with somebody. Yeah, um, what I like to use is this whole continuum, I use the word continuum, it's not your word of continuum, but we basically, do, we take the concept of stillness and we place it on a continuum of subjective experience. And if stillness is something that we aim for, which we want to go into because it expands time and it allows creativity, or is still this falling into the abyss, the depths of despair. And you'll find that people will uh, treat the construct or the concept of stillness on along this continuum. So for me, I would just stillness, if I can experience it, you know, time expands. But for others, once they start to feel that they have to keep moving, so in a sense, they're falling down into an immobilization or in polyvagal terms, they're going into a dorsal vagal uh, defense mode, they're dissociating. And so you find this with people who are survivors of trauma, they just can't sit still. They have to do high risk behaviors, keep mobilized because if they sit still, their stillness is a vulnerability. And what we want is stillness not to be a vulnerability, but to be that uh, signal of accessibility. This is the moment 
that I'm approachable. And that's exactly one of our prime uh, feelings that we aim towards, where we slow down enough, and it's and where we realize we are a fluid system, mm -hmm. and and there's not really stillness there. There, there is all this fluidity, this flow, mm -hmm. these waves, but it's so peaceful, and it you feel it's a place where you get such nourishment mm -hmm. from. It, and it, and you don't get that unless you go and you know and stop. So, so. I would I would uh, reconfigure or deconstruct what you're saying, and this has a lot of the similarity with cranial sacral philosophy or cranial sacral modes, and that is if and this is really the polyvagal take of it all, that if you throw away the defensiveness, the body's endogenous rhythms start to express themselves, and that. Can be psychological stillness, but what it really is, it's allowing the homeostatic, the neurophysiological processes to optimize how they function, meaning it provides the platform for health growth and restoration. So it's really saying if we take away the envelope of defense, the body knows what to do. And I think that's very much rooted in continuing movement metaphor, that you take away the defense, which can often be just merely uh, being too self-conscious of yourself and you just allow the body to be and suddenly the rhythms start to come through and this is of course what I was saying is part of uh, cranial sacral modeling it's saying that the endogenous fluid it's also in in cranial sacral it's cerebral spinal fluid starts to show rhythmicity from from the the head to the to the tailbone and it starts and reversing its rhythms because our physiological rhythms become more pronounced when we stop inhibiting them with our reactions to the world around us, meaning our defenses. So Steve, uh, I am a psychologist. Mental health is really, really important to me. And I was wondering what would your take be on the psychological consequences of continual movement? Well. Well, Don Lee, I think it's a wonderful question uh, because you have been in the room to observe it. So you actually know the answer probably better than I do. And that if we, as we've been discussing, is that uh, part of the continuum uh, strategy or metaphor is to move out of states of fear or threat and to allow the endogenous bodily rhythmicity to express itself. So what happens mentally when people move out of states of threat? They become more connected with others, more socially engaged, and much more resilient. They become more embodied, if we use again a new catchword. So they become connected to their body, and in becoming connected to their own body, they are. It's actually easier for them to connect to others, and this is your group uh, technology, which is embedded in continuum. So you're enabling people through exercises to become embodied and through proximity and through group processes to become connected. So you start seeing all these advantages that you would see in various, let's say, uh, quite involved mental health uh, programs embedded in this really pleasant uh, uh, strategy called continuum movement. I like that a lot. I. I... You know, I have been teaching students uh, to become teachers in Continuum, and we have these, what I would call small pods, say 10 to 12 people, and, and by the end of the 10 modules, we are so in love with each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that describes it exactly yeah. right there. Yeah, and, and you can say you're so connected, you become family. We have, and, and, and you know, and it goes on. I mean, we, uh, it, it, and you just, and the world for me keeps becoming safer and safer, mm -hmm. which is one of my major goals. Uh, yeah. cause I didn't always feel safe in this world. Well, and what you're describing, and in a sense, this to me is really the theme or goal of polyvagal theory. It's the honoring that we as a species want to connect. We want to be safe with others. This is really who we are. Uh, we don't want to be in states of threat. We don't want to be evaluated all the time. We want to share. We want to share the joy and we want to share the voice. We want to witness and we want to give each other a voice. Ah, so well said. So beautifully said. <laughs>
Um, so I think I, I just would like to I tell you how much this um, has meant to me. I hope we have more dialogues. I want to have some dialogues with Sue about mm -hmm. uh, things. And, and um, I get this can be edited out if it's, if it's too much, but that you have come into my life, Steve, you and Sue. You have brought such safety. You have bought, brought this intellectual stimulus that you, you, you open, you start talking, doors start opening for me. So I just can't tell you how, how I'm going to be crying, <laughs> well, how precious it all is for me. And so thank you so well, much. Well, Donnelly, you're very welcome. But the, the gratitude is a shared gratitude because it's not merely uh, uh, you're giving a lot and we're growing together and you're, you're enabling us. What we're learning actually through your presence is that, again, I mean, you hate to use these, this trite term, we are not alone. So it's like people with, with uh, in a sense, good values, good things happen to them. And we want, in a sense, this to expand and want people to feel sh a shared responsibility, a shared commitment, and a shared optimism. And as we build positive narratives for the future of humanity, we want people to really love who they are and not feel bad that they are what has happened to them, but that what they can become. So we want the positive narrative. Thank you, Donnelly. Thank you. Much love. <laughs>